Okay, everyone, we're back again with our second installment of the Chapter 1 uh, discussion of the material. So let's go ahead and uh, dive in here and look at what this, this concept of a sense of place is. Now, used to be it wasn't that long ago that, that people developed a very strong tie with the place where they were born. They might not travel a handful of miles away from the very place where they were born before they would end up you know, dying. That was the way it was. But now we have a globalized culture. You could be on the, you know, uh, with technology and transportation systems, you could be on the other side of the planet within a 24 hour period. And you look at pandemics, you know, and the spread of disease or the ability to be, again, you know, be within a few hours, uh, thousands upon thousands of miles away. But as you look at what matters to you? What is, and you see it's highlighted here in bold, topophilia, this love of a place. You know, this is Italy you're looking at, okay? This is Venice, and you can see the gondolas and Rialto Bridge, and I visited here. I don't, you know, it was something neat to see. I wasn't, uh, my wife was more interested in it, actually, than I was, but it was pretty cool. We we had a good time there with our children and, and whatnot. Um, I tend to like more, uh, less developed countries uh, and more unique people uh, in a certain way. But that's neither here nor there. Lots of people love <laughs> Italy, and it shows by the millions of tourists that go there every year. So in, in understanding that it can be physical features like mountains and beaches. Gosh, I need a beach right about now. I'm betting all of you do listening to me. <laughs> but then also, too, um, what is the architecture and the artwork? And what is the food like? I mean, think about food culture. Again, um, I'm really drawn to Indian cuisine, but maybe you like whatever you like. Um, and that's what this love of place is, this sense of place. And then that is why we create things like uh, Las Vegas and casinos here. They, they jump in and call this the Venetian. So if that appeals to you, you can go in there and there's certain places you can go uh, inside that casino and it, you know, it's water everywhere and it gives you a sense of, you know, old, old Rome feel. Uh, but just understand that this is going to play a, you know, a, a, a sizable role in this course this semester, and you probably already experienced some part of it. Now, I need to do this with you just so that you understand about space and time. So I won't spend a lot of time on it, but you do need to know these things that are here. So take a screen capture, pause it, write your notes down. That's a better way to learn, you know, write it in it down. But when we look at latitude and longitude, this is a mathematical calculation, very specific about places, okay? So uh, the way it works is this, that there are lines of latitude based on the equator, that's the baseline, counting to north and south. So don't tell me, you know, lines do this, say the distances that they are measuring from the equator with latitude, which are lines of parallels, they never intersect, they're measuring distances and places away from the point zero up to 90 for the North Pole and to the South Pole, set 90 degrees south. So you're measuring distances north and south of the equator, okay? Conversely, with longitude, this line actually goes right through London, England, more specifically through Greenwich, which is kind of a subset of, of London. But uh, this is our prime meridian. So this is how we count for, uh, you know, to the east, we count 180 degrees that direction, diametrically opposite on the back side of the planets, what, what we call the international date line, where every new day begins. Uh, but Greenwich here is our baseline. So from baseline zero prime meridian to the international date line, that gives you the eastern hemisphere, and then going the opposite direction from the uh, prime meridian and around the other way, western hemisphere. Equator gives us the northern hemisphere and the southern hemisphere. And so these key lines are all based on the fact that the uh, axis is tilted from true perpendicular about 23 and a half degrees, okay? So at specific times of the year, uh, the sun would be striking at on the equinox at the equator, okay? And at the very extremes, like in the summer solstice or the winter solstice, the direct rays may be striking in the north at Capri uh, Cancer or in the south at Capricorn. And then all you do to find the Arctic and Antarctic circles is to subtract 35 and a half degrees from 90. And this would give you 60, uh, oh, this one should be south right here. I just, 
I just noted that. Uh, yeah, I didn't change these. I apologize. Cancer's in the Northern Hemisphere. Capricorn's in the Southern. Uh, I'll make that change. I'm sorry. Um, but uh, Arctic is in the North and Antarctic is in the South. I did a bunch of copy and paste and didn't follow up to fix that. My apologies. But correct it in your notes. Um, so uh, in looking at how we measure things out and how we find places, this is, um, this is pretty important. And you'll see later in the semester about how we demarcate land and how we uh, parcel it up at times. And so to look at the backside of the Earth, but using a thing that's really nice, is, the, uh, is Google Earth. So this is Google Earth. I just took a snapshot of it, of the international date line. And so it's not a straight line here because we make these things up. We do it ourselves so we can measure stuff, that is, humans do. So, you know, the, the line jogs a little, uh, you know, east here uh, to accommodate all of Russia, jogs back west again here to account for the Aleutians, which all belong to the United States. And this is Kiribati, this little corruption, if you will, here. So uh, falling on either side of that. So it's the same hour on the clock, but actually if you're on this side of the line, it's tomorrow. And if you're on this side of the line, it's today. So when you fly to China, as we did, uh, I flew with my students one time over here, um, you know, it's already the next day when you get there and you you're thinking, oh my gosh, I just lost a whole day of my life. Well, maybe if you stay in China for the rest of your life, but if you come home again, you get it right back. <laughs> All of this is to say, again, you have to start a day somewhere and we want it to be out in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific Ocean so it doesn't cause problems. So uh, this uh, situation here is really very neat. I have other you know, lectures on that. Maybe I'll give you links to it or something, but this is all I want to cover for now for us in this class for these purposes, okay? All right, let me do tie together a thing, though, uh, about time. Uh, so I mentioned time and space. So this, let me back up one second. If we look at latitude, guys, and I just mentioned the times of the year, like in, uh, that with the, when the direct rays are striking at the equator, we, these are called equinoxes. So everybody has the equal amount of nighttime or 12 hours of daylight and darkness. Uh, but when the sun is striking either in Cancer or Capricorn, um, this is bothering me, so I'm going to, ah, so the miracle, uh, the wizardry that is technology, I've changed these. Um, but the sun's rays would never, never strike at the Arctic Circle or Antarctic Circle. They would only go as far away from the equator as 23 and a half degrees north of south latitude. But this gives us, when it's striking in the north, uh, the southern hemispheres in their winter, whereas we are going to be in our summertime and vice versa. Uh, in our winter solstice, uh, when the sun's rays are striking at 23 and a half degrees south latitude right down here, this is their summertime, but our long our shortest day of the year or the darkest part of winter. Uh, so this has to do with our position around the sun and what our relationship is with it. And so latitude is based on revolution, revolution of the earth around the sun. Longitude's a different time. So this is calendar time in latitude. With longitude, we're talking about 24 hours a day, okay? So that one has to do with our spin, our rotation, of the earth on its axis and we've decided that it takes 24 hours for that to occur and that being said then we need to see here that um, that this time zone map is also another human creation uh, so that we can help understand how to better allot time this came about by the way these time zones came about in 1884 at a meridional conference in washington dc and all the uh, most uh, industri the industrial nations of the world got together and said, hey, we're having a hard time hitting train schedules and, and uh, you know, steamships and all this kind of stuff. There's undersea cables and we can have in almost instantaneous communication with other continents. So they wanted to organize time. So all they did was take the 360 degrees from the, here is the prime meridian, okay, it runs right through here. Uh, that's the center point right there. There's 180 this way degrees and another 180. So that makes 360. So 360 degrees divided by 24 hours gives you 15 degrees of longitude. And that's exactly what they did here. So from the zero at Greenwich uh, in England, they went seven and a half minutes this way and another or a degree excuse me seven and a half degrees this way seven and a half degrees this way and built a 15 degree time zone now here's again what it means 24 time zones at 15 degrees 
of longitude. If you multiply 24 and 15, you'll get 360. So all of this nice geometry that you see here or across the oceans here, here, and here, all that's all beautiful. But mind you, these time zone boundaries run through where people live. And what we do with those guys is we jog them east and west to minimize the disruption of people's lives with where we put these lines, okay? So the Eastern Standard Time, you know, if everybody, uh, let's look at China for just a second. China is a country equal in size to the United States, all right? Equal in size. Look how many time zones it has. One. Now, why is that? Because Beijing said so. It's an authoritarian country. And they said, I don't care if you live out here in Xinjiang, you're going to follow the same time as we have on our clock. Uh, not many people live out here, though. This is very dry or high elevation. There's not a lot of people. Most of the Chinese, you know, 1.3 billion Chinese live in this area right here. So it's not a big disruption for them. But what if we did it here? So if you're going to work at 8 o'clock, you know, in the morning in Washington, D.C., and they, Washington says, you have to go to, everybody goes to work at the same time. Well, imagine what Los Angelinos, Angelinos are doing. So look at it. It's 8 o'clock here. It's going to be 7 here, a.m., 6 a.m., 5. Who wants to, in California, get up and be at work at 5 o'clock in the morning? So, obviously, that doesn't work. So, obviously, we're going to split this stuff up. And these are arbitrary lines, but they are decided by governments. And the, and the government of Tennessee did decide that that line would run between Middle Tennessee and East Tennessee. So anybody that runs over to see UT Vol games or wants to go over the Smokies or something like that recognizes that you're going to add an hour going that direction. If you don't ever come back, you lose that hour, right? Well, if you come back, you'll get your hour because your clock will set back again. All right. So understanding that this is a, good, a, a movement. This is, again, rotation on an axis. This is longitude. Whereas we were looking here again, revolution around the sun and latitude parallel lines. All right. Again, enough of this. I'll move forward. This is a little tedious, I'm sure. All right. Now let's look at regions here for a second. Again, you may want to do a screen capture here or or take you some good notes. And again, I really advocate writing notes because writing is learning. Doing is learning. Okay. So formal regions, to be brief, you can look this over. You can look at it in your book, but basically are uniform or homogenous. It doesn't mean there isn't any differences within those regions, but it certainly means that for the most part, in a given region, like say, you know, where a common language would be spoken, English across the United States, but we certainly know that in the Southwest, that more people are going to be probably speaking Spanish. Or if we look at religion in the Deep South, we see that this is the Bible Belt. So it's quite unique for mostly 50% or more ba people are Baptists down here. So when you look at these things with a formal region, they're fairly homogenous, but doesn't mean that everything, you know, has to be a certain way. Any more than climate had to be the same or landforms. Uh, there's lowlands, obviously, in the far western part of our state of Tennessee, uh, over by the Mississippi River. But if you go up, you know, in the east, you know, you get mountains and uh, uh, you know, the Smokies, okay? And looking differently, then, we're going to look at functional regions having a nodal point or a focal point of some sort of activity. Uh, so when you look at this next map, I'll show you uh, that roads and railroad systems, more people are going to come uh, to shop, for instance, sports franchises, you know, go Cubs, go Yankees, go Tennessee Titans, go Preds, right? So you're going to have a hard time finding Preds fans out in Wyoming, but that's kind of the point. So... Um, uh, so when you're looking at these functional regions, do try to understand what is intended by the difference between the two. Okay, so uh, we see a formal region here. This is a really remote place up in the far north. Inuits are in, in you know, northern North America. Sled dog teams, they certainly look for seals and, uh, and elk and caribou. Okay, uh, if you're over in Europe, they're going to be reindeer. But this is a formal region among this people that live in this area. Okay, let's look here. Um, tell you what, I'll come back and I'll start on this one. I only get about 15 minutes, so it's kind of short presentation. So I'll start with language regions when I come back. Okay, guys, see you in just a bit.